film and television documentaries that explored the secret lives of wild animals in incredible detail. But today, not a single corner has been left undiscovered or unaffected by civilization. The population of almost a billion inhabitants doubles every 20 years, creating enormous pressure on wildlife as competition for land, fresh water, and food increases. Africa has 1,200 protected areas, covering 2 million square kilometers, just 9% of the continent's surface area. These tiny islands of wilderness are under ever greater pressure from development, which threatens to reduce them even further. At the beginning of the 20th century, few of the peoples of sub-Saharan Africa were agriculturalists. They lived by hunting, and the forests and the savannas were an endlessly replenished food store. Killing an elephant, as cruel and unnecessary as it seems today, would feed a whole village for many weeks. In the 20th century, hunting as a sport, a leisure activity, and a business changed the balance between humans and animals. Killing was no longer a question of self-defense or finding food, but of flattering the hunter's ego. The big cats, especially lions and leopards, the most feared of Africa's predators, were the preferred targets. They were slaughtered in every corner of the continent. Africa quickly became a killing ground for many species, the result of uncontrolled hunting by locals and foreign visitors. Nothing was done to check the race to gun down any animal and take home its horns, teeth, skin, or head as a trophy. Today, Big game hunting is a strictly controlled exclusive activity, regulated by national governments, which allow only a limited number of animals to be killed, to maintain the right balance between different species on reserves. But these controls have been imposed too late, after years of devastation. Mankind is the principal rival, enemy, and threat to all other species, the apex predator of Africa, threatening the very existence of the great carnivores of the animal kingdom, the lion, the leopard, and the cheetah, in a desperate fight for survival. The populations of large carnivores in Africa have declined alarmingly over recent decades. The relentless destruction of wilderness areas, the effects of poaching, and the hunting practices of farmers and herdsmen make it likely that big cats will soon disappear from most of their natural habitats to survive only within the confines of public and private reserves as part of controlled breeding programs that supply the tourist industry. This has set alarm bells ringing for naturalists across the world who have set up urgent campaigns to raise international awareness of the problem. You need the governments of all the other countries to wake up and quickly, you know, preserve some land um, so that the wildcats can still forage in there and then, you know, start settling down. But you will have to do that. Otherwise, just open free roam? No, none. It will maybe 10 years and it will be nothing left. If population growth continues in the world over the long run, it, it, there won't be space left for, for large predators, I think. It's, 
if, if we as a human species continue to reproduce at the rate we are doing, we will not be able to save enough areas for wildlife. Um, yeah, that is the sad reality. The reality of it is, is that if we don't do something now, we are going to lose them. We are on the trail of a leopard and her cub in the Arindi Reserve in Namibia. She has been fitted with a tracking collar, which will enable us to find her among the dense vegetation. The leopard is highly prized by poachers for its skin. It is also the big cat with the worst reputation among farmers because of its predatory instincts and its elusive nature. Our visit does not irritate her, but she pays close attention. She calls out to her cub, warning her of our presence. The team at Arindi has named the mother leopard Honey. She is not afraid of us, but just to be sure, she never lets us out of her sight, calling to her cub all the while. The cub is hiding close by. It can hear its mother, but for a long time will not come any closer, staying well out of sight of our cameras. Mother and daughter finally meet up behind a thick wall of undergrowth. Female leopards that have given birth deliberately avoid males and other feline competitors seeking out a safe territory where they can raise their young. Each leopard lives and hunts on its own home range, an area it knows intimately and which it will defend with its life. She had a territory right next door to where we are. She gave birth to, to the cubs. And what she did, she gave her daughter a piece of the territory where she grew up. So from where she was born, that's the piece of territory that she gave this daughter. So wondering how she knows the territory so well. She was born here. She's been here since, since the very beginning. She knows exactly where to go to hide. She knows where to go and find where the springbuck are hanging around or the warthogs for food. She knows every little tree, crack, if she needs water, she knows where to go. And the reason she knows it so well is she's been here since the day she was born. A leopard's territory can cover as much as 20 square kilometers, a large area usually coveted not only by rival felines, but also farmers in search of a plot of land to live on. Honey sets out to hunt. She allows us to follow her, but first she makes it clear that we should keep our distance. The leopard is the stealthiest, most daring and independent of all the big cats. Its self-sufficiency and adaptability enable it to live in places where other predators could never survive. Wherever it goes, all its senses are alert to any smell, sound, or movement that catches its attention. Adult males can weigh up to 70 kilos, while females around 60. Females have a gestation period of 90 to 105 days and normally give birth to a litter of two or three cubs, which they will care for until they can fend for themselves. Leopard numbers are falling fast, but despite predictions of its imminent extinction, it is faring better than lions and cheetahs, thanks to its finely honed survival instincts 
which drive it to find habitats that are as far from civilization as possible. On the Arindi Reserve, the big cats have thousands of hectares in which to roam and abundant fresh water and prey. But this is a controlled freedom. The rangers monitor them to track their movements or to locate them for visitors on safari. Lions are the most social of felines. Normally they live in large prides formed of related adult females with several cubs of up to three years of age and one, two or even three adult males, one of them the dominant leader. While the males are mainly concerned with protecting their territory from possible intruders, the females take care of the cubs and also hunt, a task to which the smaller, more agile females are better suited than the males. Whether hunting or caring for their cubs, the lionesses display a marked spirit of cooperation. Watching the tenderness they show their cubs, you would never suspect the aggression with which lionesses will fight to claim their share of a kill or to defend their pride. Not far from mother and cub as they play, a male prepares to finish the remains of an oryx caught some hours earlier. He allows us to approach and watch him eat from a distance. He settles down to enjoy his feast as if we were not there. Lions will avoid conflict with humans as long as they have a habitat large enough to meet their needs for water, prey and contact with others of their species. Visitors to game reserves tend to see lions either as ruthless killing machines that must be kept at a safe distance, or as high-maintenance pets that exist as attractions for our amusement. But neither is an accurate picture of an animal that is well able to decide what it dislikes and what will make it happy, especially what will make it happy. They want to live in freedom, in a pristine environment, with abundant hunting, a habitat in which they can survive without pressure. Unfortunately for the lion, sprawling cities and loss of wilderness areas mean pressure is inevitable. In the future, lion numbers may be reduced to 10,000 and confined to wildlife reserves.
He is blissfully unaware of it, but his reign is over. Africa still has wildlife havens that up until 50 years ago were home to vast numbers of animals. Habitat destruction, the effects of pollution and hunting have devastated the populations of these areas. And what were once whole colonies may have been reduced to a few breeding pairs. An extended drought, an epidemic, or an unexpected migration can wreak havoc on the delicate balance between species. When this happens, competition for prey can become intense. The advantage of life on a reserve is that a balance can be maintained between many different species, ensuring their survival. This is especially true for lions, leopards and cheetahs, which face such an uncertain future. Wildlife also has incredible potential to attract visitors and generate income. It is not surprising that many farms that once struggled to make a living raising livestock now operate as guest ranches with wild animals as their main attraction. The Nankuse Foundation has established agreements with farmers to create sanctuaries open to tourists where rescued big cats are rehabilitated a positive initiative that brings benefits to all concerned. One of these sanctuaries is home to a cheetah famous for having killed 30 head of livestock in only three years. He is a large male that was the terror of local farms before he was taken alive. Named Spartacus after the legendary gladiator, he is the main attraction of the solitaire sanctuary in central Namibia. When we get a cat that we want to release into the wild, we introduce it here first. It's, um, it's called a soft release. And what that does is it allows the animal chance to adapt to this environment before we release it into the wild. It's just like when you buy a little fish. You don't put it in the tank, you put it in a little bag and you allow it to adapt before you release it into the tank. And so we're doing the same thing here. With other species like leopard, they're very hardy animals. You don't need to do this. Uh, but with cheetahs, we found that there was more successful releases uh, when we introduced them into this uh, boma before releasing them. And it's, it's an amazing job. I love this. Um, this is called radio telemetry with my antenna and my receiver. And I'm going to see where Spartacus is. Uh, he's one of our more aggressive cats. You hear that beep? So Spartacus is quite close. Oh, it's very close. Yeah. So you can see he's a very slim animal. That's how these guys are built. But Spartacus is especially big. You'll notice he's got a very large head. Today Spartacus is a star. But he was a nightmare for ranchers who hunted him night and day and would have shot him on sight like so many other predators that threaten livestock or simply get too close to inhabited areas. And here we have some yeah. terrible traps. I mean, this is the, the, the classic gin trap. You, whether it's a small one for a jackal or a big one for maybe a leopard and a lion's or even bigger, is you basically tie it to a big tree mm -hmm. or a, wherever you can anchor it. You set it like this close to the meat. So there is it's closed, you know, so you set it, you open it up next to the yeah. meat. And when the animal actually comes to eat this meat, they tramp in it and they get caught. This, the, the biggest problem is like, for instance, this cheetah, the toe was cut off, so the toe came off, and oh. it survived, 
but it actually died of hunger long term. It even healed because he couldn't catch food so well. Yeah. This, this one, you want to see, this is a very typical one, handmade. You, you connect it with a, with a mousetrap, simple mousetrap to a string, the meat. You put a shotgun bullet in there. The, the animal pulls the meat and it sets it off and the shotgun bullet goes out and blows the animal and sometimes misses him and also wounds him and now you've got again an aggressor. In its 20 years of existence, the Africat Foundation has rescued and rehabilitated a thousand felines. Where, where the teeth and the general health of the animals in captivity are done here. This belongs to the vets that help Africat. This is where they will basically come and try and deal with an emergency like a broken leg or a, uh, an emergency or the general health check. It's done in this little clinic. So it's a very small clinic. It's a very uh, basic clinic. It's got the basic stuff. It's a clean place. It's where vets can really work. Most of this radial collaring is done pretty much in the bush so that you can get these collars on. After their rescue, most of the felines released into the park are monitored with radio transmitters. Biologists can follow their movements and get advance warning if they come too close to a farm, a village or a town. The sight of felines and other wild animals wearing radio collars is becoming more and more common. They're monitoring tools, but they also serve as protection against attacks by humans. Until recently, the collars were fitted with a simple VHS transmitter, but now they incorporate satellite GPS, so the animal's whereabouts can be tracked by computer. That's the type of collar we're looking at with that program. Mm -hmm. um, and they have what is called a VHF unit, which you use to localize the animal in the field, where you take out an antenna and a receiver to be able to find that animal on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, on the back side, you have the GPS unit, Mm -hmm. um, so every collar has this GPS unit which mm -hmm. in a preset schedule mm -hmm. um, communicates with the satellites. For us we do that on a ba daily basis so that we can locate pretty much every released animal on any given day. That we can follow them closely to see do they go into hostile farmland, do they stay on nature reserves, what precisely do they do as you said, um, monitoring their activity as good as we can. And most of the downloads are here in Namibia, where that animal is. And then you've, you'll see the whole path that the animal covered mm -hmm. since we've released it. And this that's one of the fantastic things about the collars, that you would, very, you would find it very hard to follow that animal on the ground um, to document that type of behavior, whereas the collar gives you those data uh, pretty much automatically. That's the area around uh, just north of Sossusfle, mm -hmm. the Namib Desert, red sand dunes, and here would be the Naukluft Mountains. GPS technology has enabled amazing discoveries, such as the cheetah that entered the Namib Desert, an area considered too arid for large predators, but which survived due to the lack of competition. Not far away, the biologists from the Nankuse Foundation want to replace another cheetah's old radio collar with a new GPS system. They want to know whether this individual also goes into the desert and for how long. To change collars, they need to immobilize her with a tranquilizer dart. The dart must deliver the correct dose to avoid unwanted side effects. We now, we're going to immobilize her and um The previous time that, that I immobilized this cheetah, uh, the dose wasn't high enough. I underestimated her weight. So this time I'm going to give a little bit higher dose because we have only one shot. If we miss, we have trouble. So we can't miss today.
perfect. Absolutely perfect. After being hit by the dart, the cheetah begins to feel the effects. The biologists wait for a few minutes to ensure that the animal is completely immobilized so they can safely approach her and replace the old collar. From now on, her every movement will be tracked by satellite and logged onto the computer. Yeah, I've got it. They're both brown and all that? Mm -hmm, they look very similar. Just do it, Ben. Once the GPS collar is fitted, it's time to wake her up. Dr. Rudy Van Voren administers another injection, but this time to bring her round. Although the effects of the drugs will gradually wear off, the stunned cheetah, her eyes glazed, is a pitiful sight. The biologists stay close by to check that all is well. They're worried that the tranquilizer could have adverse effects, as has happened previously when animals have had unexpected negative reactions. Seeing a cheetah in this state is a stark reminder of their vulnerability. They are animals with extraordinary physical capacities and powerful teeth and claws, but all this is no defense against the threat we pose to them. Farmers on land neighboring the Atosha National Park have notified the authorities and the Africat Foundation that three male lions have escaped from the park, entered their land, and killed one of their cows. Dr. Ortwin Ashenborn, veterinarian at Atosha, and Tammy Horth of Africat have agreed to work together. They need to find the lions, immobilize them, and return them to the park immediately. Dr. Ashenborn prepares the dart rifle. The three lions are a real danger. Once they've got a taste for cow meat, it's unlikely that they'll leave the restaurant of their own volition. It's going to be a long night. The farmers have given the conservation groups 24 hours to remove the escapees. When this time is up, they will shoot the lions. They cannot risk having the lions kill more livestock or attack the farm yeah. workers. And then from there, if there's any movement, we shoot off target. Dr. Ashenborn goes ahead of the other vehicles to locate the lions and attempt to hit them with the darts on his own, without distractions that might jeopardize the operation. Once he has successfully immobilized all three lions, he lets the other vehicles know they can approach safely. The tranquilizer darts have put the lions into a deep sleep. All three were gathered around the carcass and entrails of the victim a cow weighing over 600 kilograms, which gives off an intense smell of decay. The lions are completely unconscious, oblivious of the activity that surrounds them. Their stomachs are swollen with the meat they have eaten. 
Ashenborn makes the most of the lion's immobility to examine them and to take blood samples. He will return them to the park, but thinks that if they've escaped once, they will try it again. He fits them with radio collars so that they can be easily located. Yeah, we're going to put a collar on. Yeah, yeah, I think and so. And then we're going to, where we're going to drop them? Uh, I think the, the normal. Or maybe Rathel, The process Rathel is repeated with the other two lions. And it's flat, Yeah, it's flat, big. It's going to be a bit further. Yeah. And then we're going to be a They must work fast. The dose of tranquilizer will keep the lions under for around two hours. But this is too short a time for everything that must be done tonight. Lions have a highly developed sense of direction and ability to recognize landmarks. They roam great distances without getting lost. When they're on the move, they take in visual and sensory data and store it in their memory forever. To stop them finding their way back to the farm, they will be dropped in the park, but as far from here as possible, to make it harder for them to find their way back. These three adult lions from the Atosha National Park were lucky enough to be located in time by the conservationists. A few hours later, the farmer's deadline would have elapsed and they would have all been shot. Ah, uh, sleeping. Sleeping. Uh, can he reach the limit pin? He can reach the limit pin. Okay. Let's see the one behind you. Yeah. We reach the double line of fences that separates the farm from the park. The lions must have broken out through a hole or a tunnel. All wild animals try to break through barriers that limit their freedom. Elephants usually knock them over by charging at them, and many other species dig tunnels to get underneath them. The convoy stops from time to time to ensure that the lions are still unconscious and administer more tranquilizer if necessary. Four hours later, we reach our destination. Loading the lions and unloading them again are labor-intensive operations. We are more than 250 kilometers from the farm, deep inside the park. Dr. Ashenborn prepares the reversal dose to bring them around. Ten minutes later, they will open their eyes to find themselves in a place they have never seen before. Their adventure began four days ago, when they crossed the park boundary to find a taste of freedom and a succulent banquet. We do not know how they'll react when they come round. The scene that unfolds is fascinating. 
we see proof of these animals' high levels of intelligence and awareness. They seem fully conscious of their condition, of the new place they find themselves in, and of what has happened to them. As soon as they find their feet, each lion looks for its companions, communicating with them and checking up on them. They behave just as humans would in a similar situation. They ask the others how they feel, then encourage them to get up again. Who knows whether they'll try to return to the farm, the scene of such an incredible adventure. For them, it must seem like a beautiful dream, but for the farmers, it was a nightmare. The fact remains that wherever a lion goes, it is a dangerous predator. And the other big misconception, I think, is people always think lions are pretty cute animals. They, they look at um, things like the Lion King movie or so and then think they are cute. And I mean, they are killer machines if they, if they go out and kill livestock or even humans. They are really dangerous animals and that is what makes it really difficult to, to live with them. And I think in the Western world you've got this conception of, of these pretty animals and you've got a lot of these um, captive facilities where you can go and pet one and cuddle one. But the truth is they are really, really dangerous animals that are just made to, to eat meat and they can't do other than that. For farmers, the presence of big cats on their property is a problem with no obvious solution. Loss of livestock translates into financial losses for which governments and insurers refuse to compensate them. We as commercial farmers, uh, we see our, our animals, domesticated animals, cattle and goats and sheep, as a money-making business. We have to make money out of them, put it onto the bank and do a business out of it. So there, there is that split coming. So if a lion or any predator comes into the communal area, it's like they're robbing their bank account. For us, it's a loss of business or loss of income um, as a commercial farmer now. That's a problem. On communal farms shared by several farmers, the situation is even more difficult. These are farmers with small herds, and the loss of half a dozen head of stock to a big cat can spell ruin. This is the home of a family that was unlucky enough to lose their entire herd overnight. One day, lions broke into the sheep pen. The Africa Foundation raised money for the family to buy six lambs and so restart their business. This has helped them to get back on their feet, but in this area there seems to be no long-term solution to big cat attacks. It's not surprising that these farmers do not share the views of many conservationists and fanatical defenders of animal rights. This man knows what he'll do next time he sees a lion near his property. He will shoot to kill. So in most cases lions are found in groups. And of course that's the fear factor, because they're much bigger. Uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, if you were to try and offend yourself or protect yourself from a lion, the chances are pretty slim that you're going to survive because it's such a big animal and because they're usually in a group. Now, for a farmer to have a group of lions, um, some sub-adult males, let's take a small pride. An adult male of about 210, 215 kilos, a few females of about 120 to 160 kilos, and some sub-adults. So say you have a group of about 9, 10 animals on your property. It's daunting. And at the back of your mind, you know, how many head of livestock am I going to lose? So that's the one thing. Now, when you want to try and protect your livestock from, from lions, most importantly is you need strong and very high bomas or kraals to protect your animals inside, strong so that they can't stampede out if they get afraid, and high so that the lions can't jump in. And, of course, the base has to be strong so they don't dig in. So that's your lion. And it's very, very difficult to farm livestock with lion on your property. There is no trait more characteristic of felines than the desire for freedom, 
and they can be very aggressive in the pursuit of it. The cost of freedom is often their own life. Conflict with humans has no other outcome. Though the size of the cage may vary, the only future on the horizon for these animals is captivity. The question is how, how you handle predators in captivity. Um, it, it starts with the size of uh, enclosure you provide them. Uh, the larger the enclosure, obviously, the less contact you will have with that predator because they're, they're naturally avoiding human contact. Um, for ambassador animals that are orphaned, for example, or injured, um, human contact is, is, is often maintained to, to keep them in a tame or semi-tame state. Um, and that will reduce stress because the animal will get habituated to that uh, uh, type of contact. In, in, in cases for releasable animals, you want to minimize human contact um, uh, to a point where you don't actually have any contact with that animal and you want to provide them with the largest possible area in, in captivity so they can still exercise their, their ecology as much as possible, although in a, in a limited area. Um, but also to not get habituated and to not experience stress. An animal deprived of its freedom is always susceptible to stress. This leopard scrabbles compulsively behind the bars. And this lion hurls itself at them. In these circumstances, getting too close to a lion is highly unadvisable. Any feline, even a caracal, yearns to be free and feels incredibly frustrated when it discovers that its territory is limited and that it depends not on itself, but on its captors for food. So I think it's very important and one of the keys to conservation is adding more land to the conservation areas that are existing. But one of the most important factors for this, I really believe, is that people must be incorporated. Farms must be incorporated. Livestock must be incorporated. We all need to learn to live together. And the key is, as we were talking previously, is conservation, which is connecting up all the aspects of Africa, every single piece of it, and helping it to function together. The main challenge for conservation groups is to help people understand that it's possible to live alongside the big cats if we give them space and understand their needs and instincts. A leopard's instinct is to observe and examine nature in incredible detail. Even when it's taking a stroll, apparently relaxed and detached, a leopard notices everything going on around it. From the tracks, this female can tell that other leopards have passed this way, as well as prey, and this awakens her instinct to explore and to hunt. She plunges into the tall grass, 
There's no way of seeing what is up ahead, so she relies on her extraordinary sense of hearing. She knows what's on the other side. The head of the family of warthogs senses danger and prepares to face it. But he hasn't seen the leopard to his right, which turns to attack the females and the piglets left unprotected by the male. The leopard is an astute hunter. She has distracted the male just long enough. He will not make it in time to prevent her catching one of the piglets. The leopard is the star attraction on any safari. Many people are prepared to pay large sums of money just to photograph one. It's a fact that conservationists need to exploit, so that farmers come to see leopards not as enemies, but as a source of income. And um, People will only tolerate predators if they can get an income from them. So like in, for us, for instance, the leopards. Leopards eat a lot of kudu and a lot of oryx and zebra, which cost money theoretically to us. But the money they generate from tourism, which the guests can actually come and see them, which is very rare, that makes it the balance equal, if you know what I mean. So if I, for instance, on a farm, if a farmer can realize that he can take a foreign tourist to see a leopard on his farm, he will actually make a lot of money rather than just shooting that leopard. Because he will shoot the leopard once and he will make, say, 10,000 US dollars. Because that's what he will get from the leopard. But if that leopard lives for 10 years on his farm, you will maybe take a thousand people seeing that leopard. You will make a million dollars out of that leopard, the long term. This female climbs to the top of a tree to call her cub, a young male. The mother is unafraid of us, but the cub is not convinced and daren't come any closer. The mother moves from one side to the other, checking that there are no lions, hyenas or rival leopards in this vicinity, and reassures the cub that there is no danger. But the cub prefers to wait down below. The mother is used to our presence, feels no anxiety, and relaxes on her favorite branch. Now it's the cub that must wait until the mother finally comes down from the tree. They walk together. The mother leads the way, and the cub follows. Mother and cub exchange sounds, growls, silences, and eye contact in a private language that is unpenetrable to us. Following them, but keeping a safe distance, we have demonstrated that it's possible to live with them. But many people remain unconvinced. Remember, we are the biggest threat for them. So if they're not scared of us, somewhere down the line they're going to get shot because somebody will think this animal's got rabies or it's going to catch my cattle or my sheep or my goats and this animal will be killed. So you have to keep them scared. They have to keep their distance. They should not come too close for their own safety. If they come too close to people, they get killed. It's depressing to reflect that should this leopard ever run into a human, 
or stray onto a farm, its days will be numbered. These two brothers were found as orphaned cubs. They live in a fenced enclosure of five hectares and dream of regaining their freedom one day. If they're lucky, they will be released into a large reserve, but otherwise they will remain confined until they become irritable and aggressive. Over the last century, the pressures exerted by humans on big cats have been huge, even cruel. We have killed them out of fear, ignorance, to trade in their skins, or for sheer pleasure. This has brought the cheetah to the verge of a second and final extinction event. The first took place over 10,000 years ago and was due to competition with other predators or an epidemic. The species was saved thanks to a small group of survivors and has made it to the present day as a fascinating genetic anomaly. As well as being a dangerous predator, a leopard can be as playful as a cat. It is not always an animal to be feared. Most of the time it wants nothing to do with humans. All it requires is a territory on which it can live, hunt and find a mate. From time to time, it stares at us intently as if it expected something of us. It warns us not to come any closer, not to cross the line that would separate